This is Rahul Singh the Relayer Success Manager of ZeroX. I'm with Vitek Radomsky, the CTO of Engine, to talk about a new Ethereum request for comment called 1155. Welcome, Vitek. Hey, thanks for having me. So uh, as some background about our interview today, the reason we're talking about ERC-1155 uh, is because once this new standard is finalized, ZeroX holders will be voting on whether or not to add an ERC-1155 asset proxy to our smart contracts. So when ZeroX moved from V1 to V2 almost a year ago, actually it's like a one year anniversary I think soon, we upgraded our smart contracts to be like a lot more modular and extensible. So we have this vision at ZeroX that the world is getting tokenized, and so whatever arbitrary new asset types or standards are introduced, we'd like anyone to be able to trade it using ZeroX. With V2, we added ERC721 support, um, aka non-fungible tokens like crypto kitties. And ER7, ERC1155 is the next uh, asset type that we think could be interesting for people to trade. So the engine team has been leading the effort uh, to get the standard finalized. So without further ado, VTech, uh, can you give some background on engine and yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, so I've been working with Engine for about 10 years. I'm one of the co-founders. And we are, we, we've been traditionally a company that builds like social networks and tools for gamers for, to, to socialize and, and things like that. Um, but we've been in, working on blockchain for just over two years now. And uh, we are building a platform of tools for games to tokenize their assets. So, for example, if you're playing a, a let's say an MMORPG game or some or an RPG of some kind, if you pick up an item in that game, uh, that will actually be a token. And when we started building uh, this system, we realized that ERC-20 wasn't quite cut out for what we wanted to build because games have thousands, tens of thousands, in some cases, even hundreds of thousands of items, different kinds of types of items. And ERC-20, you can only represent one fungible token type in. And at the same time, ERC-721, while it's really good for non-fungible token cases, it also only supports one sort of class of those non-fungibles. Um, and it doesn't really make sense to, let's say, have a game that has fungibles like, you know, health potions or gold or whatever it is. Uh, you can't really do that with ERC-721. So we decided to make a standard um, and we put that onto the uh, the EIP proposals about a year ago, and uh, we've been building that out ever since. Cool. So, uh, how did you like kind of make the shift from just the video gaming industry to like more of a blockchain gaming uh, focus? Well, we realized. Okay, so we ran a platform where uh, th actually the real game that that really took off with this is Minecraft. Uh, people would create Minecraft servers, and we built a plugin for Minecraft that lets you go to the server's website, uh, purchase some kind of uh, power up in the game or item in the game, and then it automatically grants your player that in the server. And so we had tens of thousands of servers using that uh, that functionality. They were able to fund their servers that way. Gamers loved buying these virtual items, but obviously these weren't. Uh, these were just you know, centralized items. Uh, a lot of the time servers would go down, uh, their databases would be wiped, people would lose all their items. And so that was the real starting point of this idea. And once, you know, Ethereum was more mature, um, smart, like we got the, the ERC-20 standard, we started seeing, you know, smart contracts are really mature. Um, we were like, okay, let's really get into this and, and build a really good standard. And uh, it started with Minecraft and then we realized this could apply to all gaming and it could, we started seeing a lot of really cool, interesting ways you could use tokens in games. And we were like, holy cow, this is an absolutely unexplored area in gaming. Like, there's never been this power in games to actually own items that you can take outside of a game. You can you can own them yourself. Uh, you have some, you know, rules and, and, and things in the smart contract that protect you as the gamer. And you could also start building cool tools around the game. I mean, a lot of the games that I saw that were successful in the past actually let people do things like modding or, you know, they had APIs, you know, World of Warcraft has an API. People started building uh, websites that showed people's, you know, character profiles with all their items in them and, you know, trading sites and things like that. So um, this really adds a lot of power and it'll apply to any game that wants to integrate blockchain assets. Cool. Uh, could you walk me through maybe like a, an example use case for 1155 in blockchain gaming as well as like something we're excited about is using 1155 for things outside of blockchain games as well. 
yeah. Kind of use case here and there? Yeah, I have a lot of use cases. I mean, so for gaming, obviously, uh, you know, what we're building is you can go into a game. You, as, a, as a game developer, you could, for example, tokenize a bunch of your assets in the game. And you can pre-sell those assets or distribute them in some way to, to gamers. Um, so let's say while you're building your game, you can you can sell people some of these assets to fund your development. And then people will buy these things. And then when the game comes out, they can actually go in the game and use them. Um, and for gamers, you know, this is a real, like, having these having ownership and collect, collectible aspect of these items is, is really powerful. Now, another cool thing with gaming is you can now take these assets to multiple games. So there's this concept called the gaming multiverse where you can get, let's say, uh, an epic sword in one game, jump into the second game, and still have that asset on your character. Same thing with, you know, creatures or pets or any, any kind of thing. Uh, you can also add metadata to these items and, you know, build a history over an item. Uh, the item gets transferred to different people, it gets used to kill different monsters, all that history is baked into that item. But now, uh, so... The use cases for ERC 1155 outside of gaming, I mean, there's so much we can get into. Um, for example, let's see. Um, okay, let's say you have like a stock of maybe, let's say, like liquor stores or like, like liquor stock, right? And you have, you know, the, the generic, you know, uh, name brand wines and, and whiskey and things like that. Um, but then you have, uh, th these can be fungible tokens. Uh, they can be fungible tokens in ERC 1155. But at the same time, inside the standard, you can have non-fungibles. So for those like rare vintages of, of whiskey and wine, you can actually have these as NFTs because they're they're more unique. Um, and you can, you know, with with this contract, you can actually add more stock. You know, create new types of tokens, mint new new uh, uh, quantities of these tokens, and everybody can verify what what that is. Uh, another interesting one is uh, software licenses. So let's say you're issuing software licenses. To, you have to have that token to use the software. You can you release a new piece of software as the developer. You create a new token type and you know mint uh, licenses for whoever buys the license. Uh, some other some other ones, uh, for example, vehicle ownership tracing. So uh, you can mint a you can mint fungibles or non fungibles for every vehicle, uh, see which person owned each vehicle uh, over time. Uh, with the, the, the 1155 token types, you can have like classes for trailers, RVs, cars, boats, things like that. Um, and maybe one other, one other example I could put out is like uh, tokenized access to some kind of resource. Like let's say you have an API and each token that, that Gives you gives the user maybe one thousand uses of that API, and so each token type created in that your CL and fifty five contract can be a, a different action you can take in that API. Cool, and I, I think Augur voting shares as well will uh, take advantage of eleven fifty five, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, are there any other teams that are like helping you on this that you're working with, uh, or is it mostly just you guys? Uh, so there's there's a number of people building stuff on ERC eleven fifty five. Um, we have uh, a number of authors in the in the standard. Um, one of the guys, Philippe, is actually I think he's been involved with uh, Zero X and Horizon Games. Um, he's been really helpful in, in getting the standard moved forward as well. Awesome. Um, and then, uh, like, this is just like a personal curiosity question: How do you pick a number for a new standard, and do they have like a significance? Like, there's not you know a thousand and one hundred fifty five like standards right so why 11.55 like wh where does that come from okay so it's it's actually just the so it's just the issue number on github so when you go to github uh if you're in repository uh there's issues and uh the eip's repo and so you just basically you wait till there's a cool number the next number being a cool number so you like you, you go to the url and it's like if you want the number you know one three three seven you wait till like the, the issue is one three three six and then you create your yours really quick and you, you you go through the the EIP like you have to make an actual document that follows all the standard, all the guidelines there, and you post it as a draft, and then yeah. So I know there's like a few other standards. Like are are are, th are there any other standards getting like a lot of usage outside of ERC twenty or seven twenty one? Uh yeah, there's 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 a number of standards. I mean, in terms of token standards, I really think the three top like most 
interesting ones right now are ERC-20, ERC-721, and ERC-1155. Um, around the time we created the ERC-1155, a whole bunch of other people were trying to create some sort of token class standard thing. But we really went like the extra mile and just kept evolving it over the, like it took us basically a year now. We posted it almost a year ago. Uh, so we've had like 324 comments, I believe, right now on the thread. And you know, it's, it's all these people in the community just uh, putting their input, you know, oh, there's this problem with the standard. Okay, we have to change it and things like that. So the, for token standards, yeah, I really only think there's those three that are two, that are basically interesting at the moment. There may be some other ideas. Um, and then there's all, obviously other standards that, like, like for example, um, what's, what's the name of that standard? The introspection standard. So... Uh, that you know that one's really useful where it lets you uh, lets a contract determine uh, if if another contract supports a certain uh, EIP. Uh, awesome. Um, and then like over like the past year, how has the standard evolved? Like, what are some of like the issues that you're trying to like reach a compromise on? Sure. Yeah. So in the beginning, uh, the standard was, uh, you know, actually it, the core of it hasn't changed too much. It's always been, you know, creating token types, uh, being able to do fungibles and non-fungibles, uh, being able to do batch transfers. But uh, in the beginning, I think that really early implementation was like, let er everything be a batch transfer, let everything be a batch approved, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and now we realize that, you know, uh, we talked with a bunch of people and th they were like, you know, maybe we need to have some more uh, simple types of transfers. So we have single transfers. Um, we switched to using safe transfers and that was actually a really big change. So uh, we, we really uh, fleshed this out in the recent, in, in, over the last month where when some, when someone sends an ERC-1155 token, we made it really strict that there has, to, if if, an, if a contract is receiving that token, it has to accept those tokens. It has to it has to have a function that says on received, what happens? You know, do I just accept it or do I have to maybe execute some function? Um, and so that like, it, and it also uh, prevents people sending tokens to contracts that don't support them. So now you can't lose your tokens. Um, so with this, this is really important because with ERC seven twenty one, they they actually had this concept in the first in the first place, where you send an ERC seven twenty one token using the safe transfer method, and the other contract can actually respond to that in some way. But ERC seven twenty one uh, people, I guess, in the community wanted to have a non safe function for some reason. So you cannot rely on that functionality with ERC seven twenty one. So you, you can't reliably create contracts that respond to receiving a token. But with ERC-1155, we're getting really strict. We're, we've fully fleshed that out in like every single scenario in detail so that you can rely on that. So now with a SIP that you can just have a wallet with a token in it, a ERC-1155 token, you send that to a contract address and now some gameplay can be executed or some sort of exchange functionality can be executed. That's really, really powerful. So like uh, like a year later, right? Like, do you think there's uh, better ways to do like new Ethereum requests for comments, or do you think like the process right now is pretty good? The process is good. Um, it it's definitely took a lot longer than we thought. I I was aiming for you know four to six months, and it's been it looks like by the time we reach final, it's going to be about a year. Um, and that's the same amount of time as it took ERC seven twenty one as well. It took them about a year to get approved. Uh, and finalized. Um, it really just takes a lot of people coming in, uh, reviewing the standard, then takes people building things on the standard. Um, now we've had a number of projects and games make their own implementations and try things out. And then they run into some roadblocks and we even run into some roadblocks in our own implementation. So then we have to go in again, uh, rehash the standard, fix things. And because these, these standards have to live on for years, decades, uh, supporting all sorts of projects that use them, and, and they need to be applicable to tons of use cases. So it really takes a big community effort to make that. Um, and then just to shift focus a bit, um, to go back to like blockchain gaming, like where do you see the blockchain gaming space moving uh, and going forward? Well, I think the the whole multiverse concept uh, is really hasn't been explored yet. So we're going to see games take multiverse assets and use them in ways that we haven't expected. Um, I think 
you know, already with the games that we're working with that engine, um, they're starting to use tokens in really unexpected ways. Uh, one guy is, is Alterverse is basically tokenizing game servers. So now he has a model where just people, you know, that, that, that are gamers and want to make some sort of side income can actually get a token and, and run a game server um, and make some money off that. And uh, I think in general, like, the, as the tools become mature and as the tools become really easy to use, I, one thing I might, I, I think we're going to see is gamers tokenizing things inside of games. So you join a game and whether it's, you know, you're crafting something inside that game universe and tokenizing it as a new token, uh, or if you were maybe making skins or something like that, like, you know, there's a whole community on Steam right now that builds 3D models and assets. Um, now they can tokenize them and make them limited run items and sell them. So that could be really interesting in gaming. Uh, another cool thing people can do is, uh, one really cool one is uh, signed items by uh, star players. So in some of these games where you have you know, famous Twitch streamers, uh, really uh, hardcore tournament people, uh, the, the famous players can actually you know, take one of your items, sign it, and give it back to you, and you, know, you have that now. It's pretty cool. So are you talking about like you know Trezor signatures or like uh, like Ledger signatures, something like that? Uh, no, actually, I'm I'm talking about uh, like a metadata signature. So th they can apply on-chain metadata to that item ID. Uh, so you know, who knows? Maybe some games can actually do things like uh, they have some sponsored players, and if they sign your gun or something like that, then it starts glowing with the the player's color or has their logo on it or something. You know, who knows? You can do a lot of cool things with that and start promoting your game more. Cool. Um, and then last question, you know, just to plug in zero X a little bit, uh, how do you see like exchange being a part of this like nascent blockchain gaming space? Uh, it's, I think it's something that we talk about with just about every game. Uh, so it's going to be huge uh, for games. Uh, a lot of games want to have a secondary market, especially games that are getting to blockchain. They want to have secondary markets. They want to have people exchanging items. Uh, so I think zero X, making this into a protocol, being very open this way is, is really cool. And if we had 1155 support with this, this would be really uh, amazing. I mean, the whole thing that, it, that blockchain actually lets you do is take these items outside of the game, um, you know, create a whole uh, real world marketplace around these things. So uh, it's, it's definitely going to be very cool to see. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be interviewed. It was a really, really good one. Thanks yeah, so it was fun. Thank you.